have we? Yeah, because you're up first. Oh, okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Toby Feakin. I'm from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome you, uh, firstly, to uh, CSIS this afternoon. Um, thanks to James Hamray, Jim Lewis from CSIS for um, making this possible today. Today, we have had an extended discussion on various aspects of the cybersecurity relationship between our two countries. An incredibly productive day, um, and uh, Prime Minister and Secretary Johnson will be happy to share the outcomes of the day's discussions, which you uh, so innovatively instigated back in January this year. Um, we've really worked hard today and, and very pleased with the progress that we're making on various issues of, of cybersecurity. Um, last night, I made some, made some welcoming remarks at a reception we had just across the road at the Australian Embassy. Um, and, and, and I think that Jim didn't quite really know what he was getting into when he said yes to this dialogue. I, I, I think the last thing he expected was that we were going to bring a Prime Minister along with us and, and also Secretary Johnson. So thank you very much to rising to the challenge. Um, we really have had a fabulous day and we'll certainly be following that up in Australia next year and, and we can invite many of you who are here today again to, to come to that. Um, thanks really must be extended to Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, Secretary Jay Johnson for lending their support to this whole endeavour. It raises the profile, creates additional interest and impetus behind uh, what we're trying to do. But additionally, Alistair McGibbon and Michael Daniel again for all of the support you have provided in driving this whole process forward and making sure that room was filled to capacity and beyond. Um, it's true to say that the Australian Prime Minister has really grasped this issue of cyber security in a way um, that we haven't seen leadership do before in Australia, and that's certainly given it the strategic lift um, that it requires. And um, the final thing I say is that I, I remember, Malcolm, our, our first exchange on cyber security issues was at a wonderful Australian tradition called a politics in the pub, um, where essentially on, on a stage in front of 200 constituents, Lucy's grinning because I remember you were sitting at the bar watching us uh, <laughs> unravel in our discussions. Um, two hours of uh, alcohol-fueled discussions which were fabulous in their intensity and, and, and I think... That much fun. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it looks like we've come a long way from, from, from there, Malcolm, to talking about cybersecurity and perhaps yeah. more salubrious surroundings. So um, thank you for the support, yeah. both of you, and I look forward to the discussion now. Now I'll hand over to John. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'm John Hamry, and the president here at CSIS. And the most important thing for me to do today is, first, I have to give you a little safety announcement. When we have people from the outside come, we begin with a little safety thing. So I'm the responsible safety officer. I'm going to take care of all of you. I'm not going to take care of them first, but I am going to come back and get you. Uh, the exits are right behind us, and the stairs down to the street is behind you. We'll go over and meet at the uh, National Geographic, and we'll have ice cream. So you'll enjoy getting over there. We'll celebrate that we've arrived safely. Uh, but do follow my instructions in case we do have anything that comes up. Thank you. Uh, it's a real privilege, of course, to welcome the Prime Minister. It's the second time we have a chance to welcome Prime Minister Turnbull. Uh, you know, any think tank president that gets to introduce a Prime Minister, you expect to hear a pretty flowery introduction. And, and of course, I'm going to do that. But uh, what I would like to highlight is the unusual nature of the purpose of his visit. He put, uh, he put a challenge to the United States when his first visit was back in January, and he said, we have a serious challenge about cybersecurity and we want to be working with you on it. And this is a, quite important that he did that. My last job when I was the Deputy Secretary, I went around to 12 different countries to talk about cybersecurity and frankly got nothing done. But when a Prime Minister takes it on, things happen. And I think it reflects both his professional uh, his professional experience as a businessman and a high technology businessman, but also his deep commitment to the security of Australia and knowing that that has to be in an active partnership with the United States and with other countries. And so we're delighted to have you here, Prime Minister. You've been the impetus behind this meeting and I think we look forward to having a chance to hear your thoughts. And before I turn it over to let you welcome the Prime Minister, let me also say welcome to Jay Johnson. Jay is a uh, is of course the, the Secretary for Homeland Security. Uh, he shares a common uh, background with the Prime Minister. They're both lawyers, but they're now practicing the art of protecting their countries. And Jay is doing a fabulous job. And Jay, I want to say a personal thank you to you. I know the sacrifice 
that you've had to take on for being in public service at this time, and I'm very grateful for it. What's going to happen is the Prime Minister is going to begin with his remarks, and then Secretary Johnson will follow him up, and then uh, 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 Jim Lewis is going to ed, you know, engage in a dialogue and then bring all of you into it. So could I ask you with your applause to please welcome the Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. That's great. Well, thank you very much, John. And it is, uh, it's wonderful to be back at CSIS. Lucy and I are delighted to be here and uh, with uh, all our team. It's great to be here with you, Jay, uh, the uh, partnership. Uh, between the United States and Australia, the alliance is stronger than ever. Uh, and the theme of cyber security ran through all of the discussions we've been having today with your security chiefs, your intelligence services. It is the frontier where we are being most challenged by the agility of our enemies, by those that seek to do us harm, those who seek to undermine the freedoms that we enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, no institution or infrastructure is more important to the future prosperity and freedom of our global community than the internet. It powers, it punctuates our daily lives, supports our business transactions, joins our nations in what is truly a world wide web. This is the modern world. Yet for all of its ubiquity, it has for the most part remained free of government domination or control. Of course, Chris Painter, I'm not looking at you in this regard, Chris, because you appear to have been of, a, of an age to have actually founded the internet, but uh, many have laid claim to that. But as we know, it had its origins in a government <coughs> research project. But the remarkable thing about the internet, despite the uh, beneficent role of the Department of Commerce uh, uh, overseeing it in a, in a rather um, uh, sort of a benign, a very benign way, uh, the it has developed uh, autonomously outside of government direction. It is the most important piece of infrastructure ever created by mankind, and yet it has not been created as most infrastructure is by governments. A free and open internet supports our democratic rights of freedom of speech, religious expression, political thought, and choice. However, governments cannot be completely hands off. They have a clear role to play in cyberspace in the more traditional roles of the nation state, protecting citizens, advancing national interests and encouraging neighbours in this exciting digital age. As I discussed this morning with NSA Director Admiral Rogers, governments also have a role in helping secure the internet. A secure internet is essential not only in e-commerce but also in maintaining the relationships that support our society. Government leads on counter-terrorism because these burdens can only be shouldered by nation states. Whereas a forward-thinking government knows it will always be entwined with industry in the field of cyber security. That's why we must work together, private sector and nation states, to secure the internet. The challenges the internet faces are greater than can be solved by any of us alone. And that's what brings me here today to speak with you about how Australia and the United States can work to secure the cyber world. I want to thank Toby Feakin from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and Jim Lewis from the US Centre for Strategic and International Studies for jointly hosting this first one and a half track cyber security dialogue. I welcome academia and industry to the dialogue. For all my enthusiasm for government's responsibilities in cyberspace, good cyber policy regards the cooperation of create and creativity of uh, the academe and industry. Indeed, government needs to be challenged by academia and industry. The nature of global telecommunications infrastructure is such that cyber in incidents inescapably engage the private sector. <clears throat> the person on the front lines of a cyber incident, incident is almost certainly a systems administrator in a private enterprise or a government department. The intersection of IT security and national security means that we find ourselves aligned with a dual common purpose, to avoid the perils of cyber threats and to realise the benefits of cyberspace. When I launched Australia's cyber security strategy in April this year, I said that Australia would be more open about future compromises of government systems. 
while breaches damage reputations in the long term, only transparency can grow trust. Kmart Australia actively disclosed a data breach late last year, and that transparency helped insulate it from more serious economic loss. Government also intends to lead by example, by initiating frank conversations about our success and also about failures, which is of course why this dialogue has been termed 1.5 or 1.5, that space between formal, one-track diplomatic interaction between nations and the more open two-track engagement. We want to be transparent, we want to cooperate, we want to be invigorated by new ways of thinking and faster ways of achieving that which the private sector and academia have to offer. That thinking and doing is how we can change the cyber world and set the future course for our societies. And we're here today to ask you for your help to achieve this. Australia is committed to standing firm for the values of an open and free internet. We will champion, champion a cyberspace in which state actors, businesses and individuals abide by international law and behave in accordance with agreed norms because existing rules of behaviour should extend into the cyber world. I've committed Australia to promote the emerging norms of state behaviour in cyberspace, unilaterally with allies and partners and multilaterally through the United Nations, the G20 and elsewhere. In April this year, I announced for the first time that Australia possesses an offensive cyber capability, a capacity to respond to state and non-state actors who attack us. This option of offensive cyber response takes its place alongside options such as diplomacy, law enforcement action and sanctions, amongst others. Now, as governments, we don't talk much about what this offensive capacity can do, nor how it can be carried out. Much as we acknowledge that we have warships, submarines, fighter jets, we don't detail their specific technical capabilities. Merely acknowledging their existence forms part of our national deterrence. In the short term, and in the absence of well-developed understandings about how to behave, there is a risk that unexplained cyber incidents could escalate into conflict, into kinetic conflict between states. That's why Australia is supporting an emerging regional framework to raise awareness and reduce risks. Jointly with the United States, we are mapping our cyber incident response structures and mechanisms so that we can cooperate in the event of an incident affecting both our nations. Online incident response goes hand in hand with incident preparedness and with real world analysis of threats. Our societies are increasingly reliant on faster telecommunications, secure data centres, satellite capabilities and smart electricity grids. That's why fostering trust in infrastructure must be taken very seriously. Australia and the US have always been very clear that damaging critical infrastructure is unacceptable. And we've maintained a strong line that cyber espionage for the purposes of commercial advantage is also unacceptable. As well as countering any state-sponsored malicious cyber activity, we're working to ameliorate the damage caused by cyber criminals. Denial of service, hacking, phishing and malware are disruptive to our economies our social interactions and, through their unwavering persistence, our sense of security. This undermining of online confidence means we are not fully leveraging the digital economy. So transparency, norms promotion and maintaining a national capacity to counter cyber threats must be part of government's contribution to ensuring Australia and the United States are secure and dynamic locations for business diversification, for investment. There is no point, however, simply being a digital stronghold in a network of insecurity, which is why nations like ours have both an obligation and a clear economic benefit to engage in regional capacity building. Consider our location in the Asia Pacific and the forays into the online world that are being made on our doorstop. New undersea cables have seen connectivity for our Pacific trading partners expand exponentially over the last decade. This increase in connectivity has coincided with a doubling of mobile phone coverage and dramatically falling internet and telephone prices, placing connectivity in the hands of millions and millions more people. It's an exciting economic prospect for our region. 
However, the Asia-Pacific region is also the most heavily affected by cybercrime, losing one-third more business revenue to cybercrime than either the EU or North America. So as well as being true to our view of ourselves as part of Asia and a partner in the Pacific, Australia has an economic imperative to build regional capacity and to smooth the way for private sector involvement in self-sustaining economies. It's in our best interests. It's also in our best interest to be a good global citizen and to promote an open and secure internet. Every ideology and every philosophy in every language is represented online. I said at the launch of Australia's cyber security strategy that the internet has changed the world, changed history and indeed changed us. It has changed how we communicate. It has changed, what we, it's how, it's changed how we communicate that which we believe and some suggest it is now changing how we think and engage in conversation. You know, we have all of us, we have in our pockets, all of us here today and most people in the developed world and shortly most people in the whole world have in their pockets a smartphone which has the processing power of a 1990s supercomputer and is connected to the internet 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is a remarkable transformation that has happened in less than a generation. So governments and businesses must be focused on the, on the cybersphere as a catalyst for innovation and growth, and security is the key to that. The cybersecurity sector could grow at faster than 10% each year for at least the next five years, far exceeding expectations of the economy generally. So my objective is for Australia to become even better placed to use homegrown cybersecurity expertise to solve these challenges and develop new business opportunities of global significance. Already we've established an industry-led cybersecurity growth centre. It will build on our expertise, promote greater collaboration and support our local cyber businesses to expand, commercialise IP and export their innovative products. I'm here today to invite you and your expertise into the cybersecurity frameworks of both our nations. I want this dialogue to be more than just an annual gathering. It must be active and interactive and ask three things of government, industry and academia between this dialogue and the next. First and most immediate, what early achievements are possible between now and the next time the dialogue is held? Second, in the short and medium term, what barriers can government continue to remove either through deregulation or positive action? And third, Articulate robust, long-term and innovative goals in cybersecurity that we can agree at the next dialogue and then pursue with tenacity. To commence this thinking on early gains and enable real progress between this dialogue and the next, we must convince leaders at board level, in the corporate sector, at government levels, that cyber is one of their essential functions. That means people must be cyber ambassadors and carry that message. Many companies have chief technology officers and chief information security officers. Both have technical knowledge and business acumen. The most obvious reason to value the role of a chief information security officer in board level decision making is the risk of cyber threat to your budget bottom line. As, we're, as we are all acutely aware, a cyber attack or data leak from even a mundane business system like email can have a dramatic impact on an enterprise. In fact, to properly recognise the convergence of online and offline threats, consideration should probably be given to now replacing the title of CISOs with a more appropriate Chief Security Officer. The cost impact of cyber attacks on companies is complex and not limited to just the loss of shareholder value, although this can be, as we've seen, significant. Listening to the risk mitigation advice of your security staff is therefore good business. But it's better business to also think broadly about the benefits of information security. Security staff could use their skills to contribute new business models that take a company into new products and markets. On that basis, we should unleash security staff to focus on both sides of the coin, of the risk coin, and to increase the value they add to their organisations. Increasing the capacity for security staff to engage in conversations with senior decision makers is absolutely critical when it comes to responding to a cyber incident. 
Many enterprises can effectively analyse attacks, build timelines of events, track data loss and restore systems, but without ongoing good communications and a working knowledge of cyberspace, your capacity to respond is hampered. In one study, 80% of organisations said they don't frequently communicate with executive management about potential cyber attacks against their organisations. CEOs and boards want succinct information, which is not always easy when presented with IT security data. Undoubtedly, the IT security function needs to work on how it explains risks to management, but it's also incumbent on management to be well versed in cyber security language and the realities of responding. How can consistent messaging travel from IT security to customers and the public when IT professionals speak a different language and the next spokespeople in the chain, the CEO, the board and the reporting media for that matter, can't necessarily speak the same languages? How aware are chief executives and directors of who has access, has for example administrative privileges over the network of their own business? Do you know your system's administrator? Good question. Many people do not, and we should. Improvements to cyber incident response are on our minds in Australia thanks to a denial of service event on our national census night. Although it was nationally significant, it was technically predictable and not a unique situation at all for businesses and governments. However, we struggled with the laden meaning of the word attack. Distributed denial of service attack is language that's begun to permeate the public consciousness. However, if a nation state says it's come under attack, the meaning and therefore the act itself is weighted with terrific significance. So we need to be able to communicate an accurate level of significance. We need to know collectively that a denial of service is equivalent to having a bus parked in your driveway so you can't get your car out that hacked data means someone broke into the garage and took the car, and that the solutions to these two things are very different. Widely understood language in other fields has been hard fought for and won. If we hear of an air disaster involving a cabin fire or an engine fire on an aircraft, we understand the difference between and the different implications of those two scenarios. The general public also knows that a black box, that great Australian invention, is important to aircraft uh, crash investigation, but that finding it can be difficult and takes time. If an air safety authority says that an investigation is focusing on locating the black box because it will yield vital clues about the aircraft's final moments, the public accepts and understands that. The conversation about cyber incidents has not reached anything like that level of understanding. Those outside the cyber security world don't readily understand the relative impact of different incidents, typical investigation time frames or likely response options, such as shutting down a site while investigating unusual traffic patterns. On that basis, I would call on academics to turn their minds to the problem of the cyber lexicon. How do we communicate clearly with each other? How do we normalise cyber discussions so that they're held in the context of all threats, risks and opportunities? And the media too should be involved in that conversation and take care to understand what is being said by governments and businesses. Now before I close, I'd like to talk briefly about fairness in relation to cyber security and how large companies can help themselves by helping others. For each large enterprise, there are many small businesses putting a toe in the water of the online world. They're connected to you as suppliers, distributors and contractors. Many are far less secure, far less savvy, far less resourced than governments and big businesses, or at least than governments and big businesses should be. To widen the web of safety, the Australian Government is providing support for some 5,000 of our small businesses to have their cyber security tested by certified practitioners. Businesses and indeed universities can further widen the net by engaging with their own supply and distribution chains and with their social good programs. Some, like those assisting women who are victims of domestic violence, hold incredibly sensitive personal information and are acutely aware of the physical safety of those they're protecting. These organisations know their moral and often legal obligation to maintain personal information safely, but most likely they're neither resourced nor skilled enough 
to be active, let alone innovative online. You would help secure the, the veracity of the internet, the integrity of the internet, of each of the organisations here with an established uh, security uh, officer, information security officer, were to seek out a small or not-for-profit enterprise with which to share your knowledge. By doing so, you'd embody the social and national values uh, of helping others, of service that characterises both our nations. In Australia and the United States, we're building cyber smart nations through investment in education, centres of excellence and dialogues like this one. We're working to keep the net safe for our citizens and their businesses, to protect the infrastructure on which we all rely and to elevate the safe use of cyberspace in our trading partners. Government by necessity has asked and will ask a lot from business to ensure cyber security, but it's because business has the imagination and the people to create the confidence that we are building. This digital century is a time of remarkable opportunity. Our response to those opportunities and to the threat of people using it criminally and maliciously will come to define the future course of our societies. So I want to thank you for holding this dialogue here. I urge you to use it to guide the web we all comprise towards both ambitious and innovative ideas, as well as practical solutions to secure the economic and social futures of both our nations. And I look forward to seeing you all in Australia next year. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. John Hamry noted that um, when the Prime Minister was here in January, he issued us a challenge in this country concerning cybersecurity. The Prime Minister has uh, given me another challenge today. I've learned a lot about cybersecurity and the job of Secretary of Homeland Security. Um, I noted that the Prime Minister delivered his remarks not from paper, not from a teleprompter, but I am now sharing a stage with a head of government who reads his speech from an iPad. Congratulations, sir. You've issued me another challenge. <laughs> As my college-age kids say to me, they're millennials, Dad, don't be left behind. Get with it. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you to CSIS and ASPI for hosting this event with a distinguished group of U.S. and Australian cybersecurity leaders. Prime Minister, I'm pleased to see you again and to join you here for this program. Today's dialogue reflects our shared values and the extent of the cooperation the U.S. and Australia share on cybersecurity. Our countries are leaders in cybersecurity. And together we share a vision of an open, secure, and reliable internet, internet that protects the privacy of our citizens and fosters innovation. We recognize the importance of our bilateral cooperation on cybersecurity issues. We also recognize the importance of cooperation in the Asia-Pacific Asia region as a whole. We're working together to build, a, to build connectivity across the Asia-Pacific so the internet can serve as a driver of economic growth and development. I believe our U.S.-Australia cybersecurity partnership can serve as a model for the international community. We have a shared responsibility to manage cyber risk, and we know that cyber risk knows no borders. We must work together to make the Internet a more secure place. Cybersecurity continues to be a top priority for me President Obama and this administration. I'm pleased to report over a year after my remarks here at CSIS on this same topic of cybersecurity that with the help of the Congress, we have greatly enhanced my department's role in the cybersecurity of this nation. Since speaking here last year, there have been some significant developments and much progress has been made. We have made tangible improvements to our cybersecurity. We've also made tangible progress in our cooperation with our international partners, Australia in particular. 
Last year, I called on Congress to pass new cybersecurity legislation. And on December 16, 2015, Congress passed the Cybersecurity Act of 2015. This new law gives the Department of Homeland Security new authorities for our cybersecurity mission. And we're in the process of implementing this new law now. I thank Congress again for passing this important legislation. On February 9th of this year, President Obama announced his Cybersecurity National Action Plan, which is the culmination of seven years of effort by this administration. The plan includes a call for the creation of a commission on enhancing national cybersecurity, additional investments in technology, federal cybersecurity, cyber education, new cyber talent in the federal workforce, and improved cyber incident response. DHS has a role in almost every aspect of the President's plan. Building on the Department's Homeland Department of Homeland Security's Stop, Think, Connect campaign, we will help promote public awareness on multi-factor authentication. We're about to kick off National Cybersecurity Awareness Month in October, and we have worked with Australia to raise cybersecurity awareness in the Asia Pacific for years. I've directed my team to focus urgently on improving our abilities to protect the federal government's cybersecurity and support the private sector. Over the past year, the National Cybersecurity Communications Integration Center, which we commonly refer to as the NCIC, that's the acronym, increased its distribution of information, the number of vulnerability assessments conducted, and the number of incident responses. Our NCIC has built a system to automate the receipt and distribution of cyber threat indicators at real-time speed, or automated indicator sharing initiatives. We built this in a way that also includes privacy protections. In March, I announced that this system was operational. We're now signing up companies and agencies to participate in the system. In this effort, we have reached an important milestone with Australia. Australia was our first international partner to connect to our automated indicator sharing platform. CERT Australia invested a significant amount of time and effort to achieve this. I thank them and thank you, Prime Minister, for your efforts. Because of this, we have set an international precedent for information sharing. Our collaboration will significantly support our efforts to share more information with our partners in government, the private sector, and with other countries. This is key to getting ahead of our adversaries. We look forward to further developing our joint information sharing capabilities. And we look forward to promoting our partnership as a model for the successful expansion of automated information sharing with others around the world. Here in the United States, as our election approaches on November 8th, the Department of Homeland Security has been offering state and local election officials assistance with their cybersecurity of their systems. To date, 12 states have requested our assistance. As I emphasized here last year, I have an I've issued an aggressive timetable for improving the cybersecurity of our government's civilian system. We have seen measurable progress since then, principally through several programs. The first is called Einstein. Einstein 1 and 2 have the ability to detect and monitor cybersecurity threats attempting to access our federal system. And these protections are now in place across nearly all federal civilian departments and agencies. Einstein 3A is the newest iteration of the system and has the ability to automatically block potential cyber intrusions on our federal systems. Thus far, Einstein 3A has actually blocked over one million potential cyber threats and we're rapidly expanding this capability. About a year ago, E3A, Einstein 3A, covered only about 20% of our federal civilian networks. I directed our cybersecurity team to make at least some aspects of E3A available to all federal departments and agencies by the end of last year. They met that deadline. Now the system is available to all civilian agencies, and 65% 
of federal personnel are now actually protected, including the Office of Personnel Management. And we're working to get all federal departments and agencies on board by the end of this year. The second program, called Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation, or CDM, helps agencies detect and prioritize vulnerabilities inside their networks. By the end of 2015, we provided CDM sensors to all participating federal agencies, again meeting our goal. Next year, DHS will provide the second phase of CDM to 100 percent of the federal civilian government. Information sharing, as the Prime Minister mentioned, is key. In September 2015, the Department of Homeland Security awarded a grant to the University of Texas at San Antonio to work with industry to identify a common set of best practices for the development of information sharing and analysis organizations, or ISAOs. The University of Texas at San Antonio recently released the first draft of these best practices. After public comment, they will be released in final form by September 30 and will be updated over the next year. Prime Minister, we will continue to take aggressive action to strengthen our defenses and put cybersecurity at the forefront of our efforts. We can't do this alone. We must proceed in the spirit of partnership. We will continue to work with our Australian partners on this important work. Again, thank you for your leadership, sir, and we look forward to your questions. Well, thanks to both of you. Uh, usually when you talk about cybersecurity, it can be a little gloomy, but I think with the leadership we've seen from the individuals on either side of me, uh, we're on the path to making things better. Uh, what we'll do is I'm going to ask a couple questions to warm you up, and then uh, if we have time, uh, we'll take one or two from the audience. I thought I'd start by picking up on something the Prime Minister said, which is that when you think about it, it is, it is a collaborative process. Um, what's the best way for the U.S. and Australia to partner? Uh, what should the agenda be for our partnership? And that, of course, is to both of you. I don't know who wants to go first, the Prime Minister. Well, I, 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 let me be, let me kick off. I think it's. Uh, I don't think you want to be prescriptive. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the important thing is <coughs> to build trust between <coughs> participants, and we have very high levels of trust. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of mutual friends here that have known each other for a long time, uh, and it is important to, to be open and to be collaborative, uh, and. As you do that, uh, you will then be able to respond to the challenges because we are all dealing in a very dynamic environment. That's the, that, that, that's the, the I mean, I said this in, at the General Assembly last night, the tenor of our times is change with a pace and scale utterly without precedent. Uh, the pace and scale of change in every respect, particularly technology, <coughs> is unprecedented in all of human history. And so that means that you need to be uh, very fast, you need to be very Im imaginative, you need to be agile, and we need to work creatively together. Now, the obvious, uh, you know, there are very, there are, there are a whole range of obvious vulnerabilities in cybersphere, but they will continue to develop. Uh, you met, Jay mentioned one, which I'll just make this observation. A trusted, a trusted, unique digital identity is absolutely critical. Identity theft is one of the biggest challenges that we face. It's, it's the underpins much of the fraud, uh, inter internet fraud or online fraud, if you like, in the world. It is something that we are working uh, to establish uh, in Australia, a number of other jurisdictions have done that. We've got the ability to considerably enhance security. I mean, one uh, feature which um, uh, many of you I no, no doubt use in the various cloud-based applications that you use is uh, two-factor authentication, uh, but obviously you can go further than that. But every level of additional security beyond simply a username and password is uh, adds much more, uh, much enhances security considerably. 
so there's some of the there's some of the uh, the approaches I think we need to take. But it, I say it has to be a very dynamic one because the nature of the threats will be uh, will be changing uh, very rapidly. Um, two things in cybersecurity. The question relates to how do we continue a dialogue or partnership. Uh, in my experience, um, a good CERT team relationship is one. <clears throat> Another diplomacy in and of itself, having a regular timetable of ministerial level sessions serves as a forcing function for our staffs to get stuff done. Mm, that's when, a good point. Um, my cybersecurity team and the Prime Minister's cybersecurity team know that in another six months or another nine months, the two ministers, you know, your Minister of the Interior or your Minister of Cybersecurity is going to sit down with me. Um, <clears throat> they got to have a bunch of deliverables. Mm -hmm. We're not going to travel all the way around the world just to meet. And so they bring deliverables to the table and we work hard to get those things done in advance of the meeting. So that to me, in my experience, whether it's cybersecurity or any number of other things, is a way to continue progress and make sure that things just don't go dormant. For those of you who are taking notes, it's six months, so get to work. Um, <laughs> let me ask a question that draws not only on your current roles, but on your previous experience in the private sector. One of the changes that you can see in the last few years is much greater attention at the C-suite level, at the board, to the problems of cybersecurity, but there's there's still a degree of caution or reluctance sometimes in working with the government. What would you say to companies about how to better improve the relationship there between government and private sector? On cyber, yep. uh, the well, the the important thing to be is is again is to develop that relationship of trust. That our um, Australian Signals Directorate has. Um, been has, as you know, and it's, it's actually it's been globally recognised. Have has uh, published some very uh, uh, good guidelines for ensuring cyber security in your organisation uh, and engages with business. Uh, it is, but you know, it, it's a two-way street. I mean, the the, the nobody is uh, no one um, has the uh, any sort of monopoly of wisdom here. And the important thing is to share experiences. Because this, this is the, the, the experience, if, if everyone keeps their experiences to themselves and, uh, and because they you know, don't want to tell anyone about a vulnerability, uh, then nobody else learns from it and other people will fall into the same trap again and again. So that's, that is critically important. Uh, you need to have, from a governmental point of view, you need to have a very, you need to have good advocates uh, you know, Alistair McGibbon, who's our, my cyber security advisor, who is, who is here, uh, is an example of a, uh, a leader in government who, is, who has both the expertise and the advocacy skills to engage right across the board, across departments, which is Ambos Ambassador Hockey, our former treasurer, knows very well, often are as reluctant to talk to each other as business is to government. So uh, there's plenty of silos out there. And that sharing that experience is uh, is is vital. So it's uh, it is, but it's the dynamic nature of the threat that's in, that's important to understand. It is they. It is not a. Um, it, it's it, it's it's not a particular vulnerability. It's a it's it's a vulnerability or a vulnerability that evolves as rapidly as the technology itself does, and the imagination that people, all of us and others, apply to that technology. <clears throat> There's the basic level of trust when you get to know somebody, uh, when somebody in the private sector sits down with our cybersecurity experts, the next Secretary of Homeland Security, they say, well, I met him, he's okay, he's one of us, it's okay, but the more important point is, and this is something I repeat often for the benefit of the private sector, the most sophisticated CEOs, cybersecurity experts in the private sector uh, that have the best cybersecurity in the private sector 
still all realize that information sharing with the government is crucial to their efforts. And if you've got the best cybersecurity barriers in the world, they all know, they all come to us and say, we want to work with you on cybersecurity, we want to work with you to partner, we want to share information, we want to know what you're seeing on a national and international level in terms of the threat streams. And so the most sophisticated actors in the private sector come to us and want to share information. That's another point. In the new cybersecurity law that I mentioned in my remarks, Congress took an enormous step to build trust by authorizing limitations on liability to the private sector for those who share cyber threat indicators mm. with the Department of Homeland Security to encourage more information sharing. And that was a big hurdle for us as a government to get over, uh, but we heard the concerns of the private sector about sharing cyber threat indicators with us. And Congress doesn't do this very often. They authorized limitations on criminal and civil liability if you share cyber threat indicators with us. So that was a big step. Let me ask each of you uh, a question, that f individual question, and since you used the uh, successor word, uh, Secretary Johnson, let me ask you, what would you say to your su successor with the caveat that this administration and DHS under your leadership and some of the others like Suzanne Spaulding has done a tremendous job, but what would you say to your successor? We're not done, what would you do? We're not done. Um, I think we're moving in the right direction, but there's a lot more to be, be done. done. And whoever my successor is, you're just gonna have to sit down and learn cybersecurity. Um, frankly, lots of people of my generation uh, have not taken the time or made the personal investment in understanding the nature of cybersecurity and understanding the nature of the threats that are out there right now. And <clears throat> it's also true, frankly, of a lot of CEOs in business. They rely on the CIOs, they rely on their cybersecurity experts, and it's not regarded as a mainstream priority of their businesses, and it needs to be. When I started off this job, I said counterterrorism is the cornerstone of our department's mission. I now say cybersecurity is the other cornerstone, um, given the threats in the ongoing series of things that we face. <coughs> Pardon me. One of the things I used to do when I talked to senators was I would always look on their desk to see if they had a yellow legal pad that they were <coughs> still writing out their remarks on. So it's gotten better if that's a metric. <laughs> you know, you don't see so many legal pads. Now, I, I want to apologize a little bit to the Prime Minister, but some of your Australian colleagues slipped me a question, and I promised I would ask it, so sure. you can see mm -hmm. it, but I'll, I'll read it. It says, you have separate policies on cybersecurity and digital transformation and innovation. Um, how do you see them joining together to provide a secure digital economy? Well, they're, they're, they're absolutely all joined up, and the cybersecurity uh, strategy and uh, investment in cyber innovation uh, in the securities field is very much part of our innovation and science agenda. And this is a this is a, a, a multi-billion-dollar industry, a multi-billion-dollar responsibility. Uh, and again, and we have considerable expertise in Australia, and it's something that we, as I said in my remarks, which I won't repeat, but uh, it is something we are certainly promoting. So it is all it is it is it is all connected. I mean in look innovation innovation is a bit of a buzzword, we know that. But it's it is very much an attitude. It's almost a cultural issue. Uh, and it is it it is um, a question of ensuring a couple of things. And you know this is in terms of organizations. You've got to be prepared to re examine the way you've done things regularly. You, you can't assume that the way things worked last year, last month, are necessarily the way they'll work to, you know, tomorrow. Uh, you've got to avoid uh, excessively hierarchical structures and blame-based uh, cultures. Mm. Uh, if you have a, and this is terrible, this is very common in government departments, it's very common in uh, large organisations generally in the private sector, if you have a, a blame-based culture so that 
the rewards for making the right call are modest and the penalties for getting something wrong are considerable. The rational actor doesn't make decisions and manages everything up. Nobody makes decisions. So you've got to have a culture which encourages people to uh, experiment but encourages them, encourages them also to fail fast. That's the other great thing that you've got to watch uh, in a culture of innovation, the tendency of people to stick stick with things that aren't working for too long because they're not prepared to admit that they're not. Now, why is this relevant to the cybersphere? It's because this is an area where you are, in effect, always in beta. Now, when we announced our innovation in science agenda in December last year, the, the minister, Christopher Pine, and I announced it, and I remember uh, <clears throat> someone asked me a question which was more or less along these lines, do you guarantee that all of these measures will work? And I said, absolutely not. Uh, I'd give no such guarantee. Some of, them, uh, some of them will work, some of them won't work, some of them will do better than others, and this is what we're going to do. The things that won't work, don't work, we'll dump. The things that don't work as well as we'd like, we'll improve. And if we find somebody achieving the same objectives with a different approach, we will, uh, recognising that plagiarism is the sincerest form of flattery, copy it. And it is very, it's, it's, it's very important to to take that approach. I mean, I gave a, a speech about this in the question time in the House last week. Um, you know, in the real world, I said to the assembled members of the House of Representatives, in the real world where our constituents live, as opposed to the world politicians live in, uh, uh, the, if you have a policy or an approach or a plan that you can improve by changing, people say, that's smart, that's really smart. In politics, it is a humiliating backflip. And of course, that is, and that is one of the reasons why governments and politicians and departments stick with things that aren't working for longer than they should. And so you've got to, you've got to basically change the discourse, I think, bring it into the real world, and <coughs> this area in particular, if there, is, if there is an approach that is not working or could be improved, then move on to fix it. Uh, and don't be concerned about uh, people suggesting that you've, you've, um, you, there's some sort of um, uh, sense of failure because you've changed your approach. It is a dynamic operating environment and you have to be as dynamic as an actor in that environment as the surrounding circumstances. We've got time for one or two quick questions. Let me ask if can you I, could can ask. I, uh, oh, can I sure. just supplement what the Prime Minister no. said? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. uh, <laughs> Prime Minister, in our country, it's called too big to fail. Yeah. We're all afraid of pulling the plug yeah. on something that is too big to fail. Yeah. In my time as Secretary, I've had to pull the plug on one or two acquisition programs that, for which we made a multi year investment. Um, and start all over again because I saw it was going down the wrong road. On the other hand, when we make an investment in a technology, a specific program, an acquisition, very often it's a multi-year effort. And yep. it's guaranteed that during that multi-year track, somebody's gonna come along and say, I can build you a better, cheaper mm -hmm. model of that. And you have to reckon with whether what you're doing is is on the wrong track or uh, the right track, and you just need to stay your course. Hmm. Go yeah. ahead. Sorry. Okay, no. Agreed. One, one or two questions, short, focused, ideally for both. Uh, <clears throat> we've got one there. If you're on that side, I can't see you, so you'll have to do a backflip. Uh, Humiliating or otherwise. Yeah, it's your call. Please. Hi, my name is Saul Garcia. Uh, what would be a appropriate response to a cyber attack? on our democratic elections. I think that's for... That's a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> what? So the question was, what should be the response to a... Uh, uh, swift. <laughs> to an attack. <laughs> swift, uh, swift and harsh. Uh, to uh, uh, look at uh, the... Uh, uh, clearly, I mean, it's a... Uh, it is. Uh, I understand that's uh, that's a, a rather a uh, car it's a it's a hot topic in the United States at the moment. So I think uh, the secretary should uh, respond to it in the topical context. But uh, I would be um, encouraging him to be, as I know he will be, to be absolutely uh, 
resolute and steadfast in ensuring the integrity of uh, your democratic uh, processes? Well, I will tell you what we are doing in the Department of Homeland Security. Um, the way our election system is set up in this country, as you know, it is so decentralized that there are some 9,000 jurisdictions that have something to do with our elections at the national level. At the county, local, state level, it is so decentralized, it would probably be extremely difficult to alter a ballot count. On the other hand, we, incre we face an increasingly sophisticated and clever range of actors in the cybersecurity space, nation states, hacktivists, criminals. And so <clears throat> I've been engaging state and local election officials this season to say the Department of Homeland Security can help you with your cybersecurity. And there are a range of services that we offer from vulnerability assessments to cyber hygiene scans, which can be done at our own headquarters of a system that's on the internet. And as I said in my prepared remarks, a number of states have come forward and asked for our assistance, but the nature of what we do is as a service provider. We offer our assistance. It doesn't involve federal regulation or federal takeovers, which I know people are very sensitive about. And um, <clears throat> I think it's important that we, we do this, and that's, that's, that's what we've been doing. Um, hmm. insofar as any efforts that may exist to mess around with the election systems we have. Uh, we're going to close with a softball, at least I hope it's a softball. Uh, in your remarks, uh, Prime Minister, you said one of the things we should think about is the barriers to cooperation between the two countries. and. When I think of countries that are similar, of course, uh, U.S. and Australia, uh, very, very close. So maybe for both of you, what are these barriers? What are the things we want to look at moving ahead? Well, I, d I don't see, I, I, that I'd be very interested in hearing from the participants here what barriers they see. Uh, you know, the relations between Australia and the United States are probably the gold standard in terms of uh, collaboration because you've got you know, we, we more or less speak the same language. Um, uh, well, that, that's what the British would say. They'd say we, we more or less mangle their language, I guess the English would say. But, the, uh, but, we, but we have a very, very similar institutions, very high level of trust, um, and a very, very, very deep uh, security relationship going back for many, many decades, as you know. So uh, I think um, I don't see a lot of barriers in our case, but I've really it's up to the practitioners. I'm not sure what, what, our, what your uh, dialogue here has unearthed, but you know, it's, it's for the politicians, for the lawmakers uh, like us, uh, if those barriers exist, then we should consider removing them because I, I firmly believe that the, that the key to effective response is uh, openness and uh, collaboration. I'd say what our dialogue on Earth is, we have some common problems, but we also have common approaches in resolving them. So there is a more commonality than you might have expected, even between the US and Australia. Secretary Johnson, why don't we give you the final word? Notwithstanding the distance and miles and time zones, I meet with my Australian counterpart several times a year um, in various different ministerials, bilateral, multilateral, and I've been very impressed with the level of cooperation, things we're doing. I think a lot of it has to do with just plain leadership and a commitment to get stuff done mm, on exactly. particular missions. And uh, as I said at the outset, uh, commitment to a continued regular dialogue every six months, every nine months, once a year, whatever. And uh, that lowers the barriers. I've had, <clears throat> I've had dialogues now with a number of countries, notably including uh, China, on cybersecurity. And I think we've been able to see 
some progress there in areas where we feel we can work together. So and I hope that continues. So uh, what I'd like you to do is uh, join me in thanking uh, two of the real leaders in the field and what's a very close security partner relationship. Thank you.